I had done a TV series prior to Halloween where I'd gotten fired, but I was one of 13 or 14 regulars on a half hour, one camera TV show. And if I had two lines a week, that was a lot. All I remember about Halloween was that it was a script where every single page had the name Lori on it. So what I knew was that it was a big part. And in, when I was a young actress, that kind of part, obviously it was not what I was doing. I was doing two lines here and there. So to have something where it was that kind of complete uh, character was kind of exciting for me. You know, what was nice is that the, the roots of this were so um, low scale, crappy little offices in this old, old building on Cahuenga Boulevard, and it was two little offices side by side. One was Deborah Hills, one was John Carpenter's, and that was the extent of their big production offices. Well, Jamie came to read for me, and we picked a scene in the script, and she read it, and she had a, I don't know, I had a quality about her. There was an innocence, and yet a strength going on in there, and I really liked it. Plus, the girl I wanted for the part had turned me down, so Jamie was perfect. There was an actress who was well-known or better known um, than me, uh, who was also up for the part. And I remember that, and I knew her name. And so, like it was with me with Deborah Winger then 10 years later, where every audition I would go into, I'd look at the list of Deborah Winger's name, and I'd be like, okay, well, I'll just go in anyway. But I mean, I knew she was gonna get it. Like every, So I knew that this woman probably had the the upper hand, if you will, or the, the you know, I, I figured she would get it because she was more well-known and had more experience. And um, that I remember, because I, I, I know who she is. When you finally got it. Yes, I do not remember finding that out. I don't remember any of it. I remember meeting with the costume woman, talking about Lori, and we went to J.C. Penney and we basically bought back to school clothes for this girl. So it was like going shopping with Lori's mother. Like we were dressing Lori. So I bought the, you know, there was that skirt and then there was the turtleneck and then the uh, little cardigan sweater and the thigh high kind of big socks. And I had had a perm when I met John, but then they decided they wanted my hair straight or not straight, but not frizzy like a perm. And so then I remember putting hot rollers in my hair each day to get it to, you know, kind of straighten out. I remember that. I don't think we ever met and rehearsed. I don't think we ever had any of that. I think it was show up on your first day. You know, right away we were working. There was no gentle entries. I think the first things we did, if I remember correctly, was the girls walk and talk on the street, carrying the books, the car comes by, speed kills, that whole sequence. And then the second half of the day was me and Tommy Doyle meeting where I cross the street, meet, walk down the street, that's the scary house. You know, don't go in there. And then I go up to the door and then we have the little scene out on the street and then the great shot later of um, Michael inside the door his POV, and then Lori walking down the street. And I remember the last thing we shot that day was me walking down the street away from Tommy Doyle, singing the little song. And I remember saying to John, very clearly I remember saying, so what, what do you want me to sing? And he said, well, just you know, make up a song. I said, because I don't sing. Really don't sing. And he said, well, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's like an internal monologue. It's not, a, she's not belting a you know, country western tune. And I remember like going, oh, okay. And, you know, really just making it up on the spot. I wish I had you all alone. I told her to make up a song, so she made it up. It's great. And uh, you know, I didn't have to tell Jamie too much. Uh, she, knew what, she knew what to do. She was just in, so instinctive and energetic an actress. I loved her, still do. What I think about it now is that it's incredibly poignant. And I think that must have been Deborah Hill. That whole idea of a girl, I would hold you close to me 
so close to me, just the two of us. I mean, that's incredibly romantic and dreamy and innocent and beautiful. And of course, you're counterpointing it with this POV of this killer behind this. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. And that was the first day. All of that was day one. Did they show you what Michael Myers would look like? No, I mean, I saw, uh, I mean, obviously I saw Nick Castle wearing it. And at the time, it was a guy in a, you know, a coverall, one piece, a onesie. <laughs> we were ahead of the game with the onesie. And, you know, this kind of white face. You know, it was so fast and furious. I really just don't think anybody, it was, there he was, and it was like, okay, let's do this. That was all the first day. I mean, it was a lot of work. I would love if somebody had the original production notes and actually, because I've heard anywhere from 17 to 21 days. I think it was 17 days. And so I think it was $300,000 in 17 days. So it was fast. And all I remember was that first day and the beautiful story that goes with that. And I like telling it because it tells you everything. And it's never happened to me again. And my guess is it will never happen. To, and I'm including this movie. I lived with a hairdresser named Tina Cassidy. We rented a house together in Studio City. And I finished my first day of work and I came back to this house we lived in. And the phone rang that night. And Tina said, Jamie, it's John Carpenter. And, you know, in my day, and I'm sure it happens now, people get fired after their first day of work. You know, the director thinks about it and goes, ah, nah, I made a mistake. So I remember like the slow walk over to the phone and being that thing of like, mm -hmm. hello. And he's from Kentucky, I believe. He was like, hey, darling, it's John. I just want to tell you how happy I am and how fantastic you were today and I just know it's gonna be amazing. Now, that just doesn't happen, you know? That doesn't happen, and that was all John Carpenter, and um, that's how it began. Nick Castle is a friend of mine from film school. We had a rock and roll band together, we made student films together, so I liked the way he moved. He, he came from a dancer family, so he had a grace, an odd grace about him. I think he just did it as a favor to John, I'm sure John just said, hey, I need somebody to be in the mask, will you do it? And, you know, maybe got paid a couple hundred bucks or whatever it was. I mean, nobody got paid anything. I think I got paid $8,000 for the whole movie, which at the time, for the lead in the movie, was $2,000 a week, which I'm not saying is nothing, but I'm saying, you know. Plus, he was free. He was cheap. So he put on the costume, and I said, now go from here to here, and that was it. I would say the reason he uh, continues to be the, have the impact that Michael Myers has is the simplicity of the evil. That there is the word pure evil, which Donald Pleasance, Dr. Loomis, says from the beginning. And the enigmatic, faceless, expressionless, look of Michael, it projects into that mask every terrifying image we have. I mean, we were talking this morning about this horrible man who m murdered his family. And he went on TV and, you know, pro professed his care. And everybody says, well, I knew he did it because of the smirk because apparently he smirks. I didn't see it, but I heard about it. You see, I think we can put all of our fears and concerns and knowledge that evil exists in the world, because evil exists in the world, and put it behind that mask, and it can be anywhere, anytime, anybody. And I think it's the simplicity of that. That is terrifying. So I think that is what endures, if I had to analyze it, which of course, you know, because the problem is, I can say all that and you guys can all be like, wow, she's really smart. That was really articulate and really thoughtful. But the truth is, it's a fucking William Shatner mask. Do you know what I mean? Like, really? 
like all that bullshit I just said about, you know, it's the embodiment of evil and it's nothing. I mean, it's just horseshit because it's a William Shatner mask that they took off all the facial expression and spray painted it white with a can of fucking spray paint and put him on in a, you know, put a guy in the mask. I mean, it's just, I'm talking out my butt because the truth is I don't know anything about why he endures. I'm just glad he does because he's my buddy. <laughs> you know, it's like me and my shadow. I mean, where would I be without Michael Myers? You know what I'm saying? So I'm grateful to him for all of his badness. Thank <laughs> you.